role does work play in your life? Is work something that you find fulfilling? Is there a sense of meaning or purpose to the work you do? Are you able to express creativity in and through your work? These questions are difficult for most people to answer or to talk about with any depth. And I think that's because we don't talk about them often. We don't give them serious consideration. It's as if work is something we do and then spirituality is something else. Today, I want to talk about work and spirituality and how our spirituality interconnects with our work. But in doing that, I want to clarify what I'm talking about and what I'm not talking about. So there's a concept called workplace spirituality. Workplace spirituality has to do with values around the workplace. There are different models for this, but essentially they all look at the workplace and whether the workplace has values to support individual spirituality. Like, is there a value for diversity, a value for creativity, a value for individual expression? Those are not things I'm talking about here today. I'm talking about you and me as people who work and how spirituality interconnects with our work. You know, when you really think about it, a lot of our day is consumed with work-related activities. When it comes to our job, many of us work 8, 10, even 12 hours a day. In addition to that, we have other work that we need to do. You know, we have work related to our home. You know, we have the, the, the house cleaning and all the different chores around the house. We do grocery shopping. And if we have kids, there's a lot of work we do raising our kids. If we're caring for elderly members of the family, there's work related with that. Much of our time is spent in work. So how is it that spirituality plays a role in any of those activities in that work? Sometimes it's easy to think that some jobs are more open to spirituality than others. For instance, we may think that artists and writers and people who are creative, that they're inspired and naturally inspiring, and that's very spiritual work. And that may be true. I don't know that that's always true. I know that people often think that the work that I do as a professor is somehow uniquely fulfilling and special. And there are some special elements. I mean, I really enjoy and appreciate when I see a student get a new idea and they want to develop it and run with it, and they're very excited with their learning. That means a lot to me. That keeps me going. But that doesn't happen very often. I spend my day as a professor pushing a lot of virtual paper. I edit documents. I review things. I serve on committees, and committees for a university are no different than committees anywhere else. And a lot of the work is simply routine. So I don't think any particular job is more spiritual than another. But I think what we bring into that job helps us to understand where spirituality is. And that includes service industry jobs and working in our gig economy places where many people work. It's the nature of work that we can express ourselves, that we can find something more. And that's what I want to talk about today and explore with you, spirituality and work, how we find and express spirituality in the work we ordinarily do. So now's a great time to subscribe to this YouTube channel as well as to click that bell to be informed of future videos. And stay tuned as we talk more about spirituality and work. Within some of the liturgical traditions within Christianity, Roman Catholics, Episcopals and Anglicans, some Lutherans, there's something unique in their communion service, the time when the bread and the cup are shared as a sacrament. That time comes afterwards. There's a moment that's referred to as 
the quotidian mysteries. Quotidian mysteries. Quotidian's a word with roots in Latin, and it means every day, daily, ordinary, the quotidian. The quotidian mysteries that happen after the communion is shared are a very simple ritual action. After this ritual meal is completed, the priest or the minister takes a moment and washes the dishes. He gathers up the crumbs from the bread and rinses out the cup with some water. And that's called the quotidian mysteries. I think that's a very important part of the liturgy because it demonstrates that after this mystical ritual representing this communion with the divine, we need to return to the day to day, to washing the dishes. And nothing can be more ordinary than washing the dishes. You know, washing the dishes is a very important practice in teaching uh, mindfulness meditation. In washing the dishes mindfully, someone is taught to be present fully when simply washing the dishes, to feel the warmth of the water, the suds of the soap, the action of washing a dish and rinsing the dish, and to simply be fully present as a way of meditation. This is such a common meditation done within the Buddhist tradition that it even made its way into an episode of the hit comedy series, The Big Bang Theory. The characters are in a soup kitchen for Thanksgiving, volunteering to serve food, and they're washing dishes. And they begin to wash them mindfully and talk about the practice of mindfulness. Another basic practice in mindfulness that's taught for people just starting to learn about mindful meditation is eating a piece of fruit mindfully. Think about eating an orange. First, sitting with the orange, taking it in, its size, its color, the feel of the orange, the softness and the firmness, and then peeling back the skin and feel the suppleness and the softness as it bends and noticing the moisture that beads up on the skin, and then eventually breaking the sections of the orange open and the juice squirting out, and the taste of the orange, the refreshness, and the way the juice is, is enlivening. That's mindfully eating an orange. You see, whether it's quotidian mysteries in liturgy or mindfulness and simple actions like washing dishes or eating a piece of fruit. These traditions are pointing us towards the importance of our awareness in doing simple routine things in life and the importance of understanding them as part of our spiritual life. It's part of the spiritual dimension of who we are. There's a classic text written in the 17th century by a French monk specifically about this. The monk was named Brother Lawrence. And the book is The Practice of the Presence of God. Now, Lawrence wasn't the head of the monastery or anybody great or respected in the monastery. He was the guy who did the grunt work. He was the one who scrubbed the floors and peeled the potatoes. He was there doing work that probably no one else wanted to do. But Lawrence reflects on the work that he does and the mindful way that he does it and how he experiences gratitude and thanksgiving and a presence of mystery in doing that work. You see, what all of these things are pointing to is the importance of bringing spirituality to work, bringing spirituality into our work the spirituality we're nurturing through our meditation and other practices and integrating it into our life in an operative way that helps to use work, the thing that we spend so many hours a day doing, as a source of inspiration. Allowing ourselves to experience work in a way that we encounter a sense of the mystery of life, 
the quotidian mystery, the day-to-day -day mystery. It's when we begin to open ourselves to that and experience something more that we understand some of the dynamic of spirituality and work. It was in the 1970s that the concept of flow entered psychology. Flow, it's understood as the experience of the affective dimension of our life and the cognitive dimension of our life coming together, flowing together into the action that we're doing. Flow is understood to be the optimal experience. It's the level of the optimal experience. The concept of flow was discovered by investigating the experience of people at work. Some of those first studies were done with people like artists and writers and painters and, and people who were naturally thought to have this experience of flow, of stepping out of time and experiencing a sense of communion with the thing they were doing. But further research was done with ordinary laborers. One of the studies I always found very fascinating was the study done with men who were working on an automobile assembly line, who day after day, year after year, for decades, did one action over and over and over again. You know, they were putting rivets onto the tire or to the wheel or whatever it was they were doing. It was an assembly line, and they're just doing it over and over again. And it was found that many of these workers on the assembly line also experienced flow. Now it's important to realize that it's not that everyone in this, these studies experienced flow. Some did and some didn't, but that flow was something that was experienced, that was possible no matter what the work was. And I think that part of how we can understand that experience of flow is the individual's willingness, openness, to enter into that flow. You see, it isn't the nature of the work itself. Work is often routine. And that's true for people who do creative things. I mean, I write. That's one of the things I enjoy doing. Sometimes writing's a drudgery. Other times, it does flow. But the important thing is not the task, but our attitude towards the task and the way in which we engage in that task. So that when we engage in something in a way that's mindful and present, we have that opportunity of entering into flow. Now, sometimes we find that flow not, not in and through the task we're doing, but because the purpose the task has for us. For example, one may be working in a particular job, not because it's the, their optimal skill, but because it's the best job they could get in the locale in which they lived. And that what they're doing through that job is caring for their family, providing a home and food for their family, and being a good supporter to their family. And that commitment to the family gives meaning to the work. Or it could be a personal meaning beyond the individual that happens through the work. For instance, engaging in that job and appreciating that job because of the educational benefit that comes from that job. So that in time, one may get a new degree and move further into work. So there are many reasons that people have that lead to this experience of flow. But the experience of flow happens for us in and through what it is we're doing. It's important to remember that in this experience of flow, it's we who bring meaning into the experience. And in doing so, it makes our life meaningful. We approach the work with a sense of purpose, with a sense of mindfulness. And that changes our, our life and our sense of ourself, and it gives us a sense of purpose. Because we value what we're doing, either for the work itself or for a larger cause, 
our life takes on value. So there's this reciprocal nature that happens in and through the work and with who we are that's part of flow and I want to suggest is part of the dynamic of spirituality and work. You see, I think we often make a mistake by saying, especially to young people, you know, aim for your bliss, work for your dream job. Many people get into the workforce and find out that no one really cares about your bliss. No one cares about your dream job. While it's worthwhile to have that sense of what would be perfect for you, it's important to know how to make the ordinary something of value to you. And when we focus on having the bliss, we miss that the bliss is experienced in the ordinary. That gets back to the quotidian mystery in the liturgical tradition. After this communion with the divine, one returns to washing the dishes. It's in that day-to-day -day activity that we live out our spirituality. It's in our work that we live out what it means to be spiritual people. I want to invite you to take some time and share your thoughts in the comments about work and spirituality and what you find insightful. Subscribe to this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, click the bell, leave comments, share the video, and know that I really appreciate your presence and your watching. Thanks.